Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Colleen Cipriani, and I'm the Associate Dean for Inclusive Excellence at the Gillings School of Global Public Health, and also an Associate Professor in our Public Health Leadership Program. The Gillings School is located on the beautiful Chapel Hill campus of the University of North Carolina. I want to first begin today by acknowledging that long before our campus existed, there were teachers, students, elders, and youth inhabiting the spaces we enjoy today, trading knowledge and goods with one another. North Carolina is home to the Okanichi, Lumbee, Kohari, Halawasaponi, Eastern Band of Cherokee, Meharan, Saponi, and Wakama Suwon nations, along with many other indigenous peoples living in both tribal homeland and urban settings. In fact, North Carolina has the largest indigenous population east of the Mississippi River. We acknowledge and give thanks to the first peoples of this land and their descendants, we look forward to building upon the honored memories and goodwill of all who walked and labored here before us. I wanna welcome you all to the sixth webinar in our Gillings Inclusive Excellence Series, Emergency Preparedness, Ethics, and Equity. Today's webinar is entitled, How Faith Leaders Are Sustaining Community During the COVID-19 Pandemic. In the interest of time, we won't be reading the full bios of any of our speakers today, but those are all available for you to view online at our Triple E website. I want to encourage all of you, our participants, to submit your questions to the panelists using the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Team members are monitoring your questions, and we will do our best to address as many as we can during the time we have together today. And now we'll turn it over to one of our two moderators, Dr. Lori Carter Edwards, Associate Professor in the Public Health Leadership Program here at Gilling. Lori? Thank you, Colleen. Good afternoon. And I, along with Goldie Bird, will be your moderators for today's session. So thank you for joining us. The service and care provided by faith communities, specifically black churches, has in many ways exponentiated as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. Dr. Kamara Jones expressed that COVID-19 has, quote, washed away any veneer of equal opportunity or equal risk in the population, unquote. So in populations already impacted disproportionately by social determinants of health, such as economic stability, education, discrimination, social cohesion, healthcare access, and housing, faith leaders and their organi organizations are on the front lines, relying on their strengths and resilience to continue to meet these needs as they have in this country since the Great Awakening in the late 1700s. As they adapt to this new normal, Pastor Janae Pitts Murdoch in Indiana states it well, quote, the world is hearing a lot of rhetoric around canceling and shutdown, but the church never cancels, never shuts down. Even when we don't gather in physical space in the building, we are always open, close quote. Today, we'll hear from three esteemed black faith leaders who will discuss their experiences in leadership and service to the community during COVID-19 and beyond and recommendations for partnerships in the future. Our first panelist is Bishop Ronald Godby, lead pastor of the River Church in Durham, North Carolina. He is a servant leader, mentor, teacher, and author with extensive experience in health equity work within the Durham community. He provides guidance and leadership to hundreds of leaders and churches across the globe. He will speak on faith leaders' impact as essential workers in their communities. Our second panelist is Reverend Dr. A.B. McNair. Senior Pastor of Mount Moriah Community Church in Farmville, North Carolina, and the Executive Pastor of Mount Calvary Church in Raleigh, North Carolina. He is also the presiding prelate of the Life Changing Ministries International Fellowship and founder of the Life Changing Bible Institute. He is a community activist for the poor and disadvantaged citizens. He will discuss how faith leadership is supporting families during this time. And our third panelist is Pastor James D. Galliard, Senior Pastor of Word Tabernacle Church in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, and the North Carolina State Representative for the 25th District. His church has grown from a 14-member plant church to a 3,300-member church serving families in 10 counties in North Carolina and six counties in Virginia. 
I got it. He leads a series of programs in such areas as capacity building, mm -hmm. childhood literacy, health and wellness, media broadcast, and faith, family, and personal development. He will present on improving and maintaining the health and wellness of faith leaders. Each will speak for roughly 10 to 12 minutes, followed by a summary of key points from their presentations by Dr. Bird. Then we will have a Q&A period with our three panelists. Please enter your questions in the question box throughout the presentations. I now present to you Bishop Godby. Bishop? Thank you so much to our esteemed moderator and to all of our uh, colleagues, Dr. McNair and Reverend Gailier. We are certainly privileged to be a part of this moment to share with you faith leaders impact as essential workers in our community. Rarely do we think of the person in the robe and collar as a first responder or as an essential worker. Are we essential? Are we absolutely important and extremely necessary? Simply ask the communities that we serve. I've taught faith leaders across the globe that if your doors are closed and no one knows or cares, you need to do your community a favor and shut those doors forever. The people that we feed, clothe, counsel, coach, and connect to resources would definitely deem us as important and extremely necessary. 2020, for the most part, faith leaders have been doing simply more of the same, just on steroids. The COVID era didn't make us essential. We've always been and will always be essential. 2020 amplified our understanding of just how essential faith leaders are. The church, the synagogue, mosque has always been the hub of the local community. It's not just a place where we gather for spiritual enrichment and instruction, but it's truly the place where we are educated, equipped, and empowered to do life on every level. It is the synergy and energy of all community. Why then are we essential, many of you ask? We are essential because when there's a leadership vacuum in our community, the community looks to us to fill it. When there's hunger in our community, they look to us to feed. When there's sickness in the community, they look for us to heal it. Need peace, they look for us to administrate it. It seems that as faith leaders, we are the first ones on the scene and the last ones to leave. From being guidance counselors to grief counselors. Others in the community get to serve in one area of expertise, but we must be trained in all as faith leaders. The police officer gets to uphold the law. The fireman protects and serves person and property. The doctor and the nurse tends to the patient. In some instances, the faith leader has to be armed and equipped with tools equivalent to those of the well-respected first responder. Metaphorically speaking, we have to have a fire hose and a ladder in the trunk of our cars. We have to have a stethoscope and an IV in our back pockets. And a few faith leaders I know have no badge, but some of them carry a gun, but that'll be our little secret. Faith leaders have always been the hub of the community and the glue that galvanizes it. When the laws of, co of the COVID era were laid down, apparently in the initial phase, we weren't factored in as essential workers. Even though we were still on call 24 seven, our phones could not be turned off and the do not disturb sign on a, on a faith leader's phone is non-existent. We are viewed by many as the hands and feet of a sovereign and almighty creator. Many of you get to fail and people will inevitably blame you. But if we fail, they inevitably blame God. To show you just a little bit of the weight that we carry as faith leaders, let me give you a few things that might be shocking to you. The profession of pastor is near the bottom of a survey of the most respected professions, just above, get this and no slight to them, but just above car salesmen. We've heard the jokes, we've heard the derogatives about car salesmen, and I think that very few of us would want to be considered after giving all of our lives and being consumed with the care of our community to being ranked just above car salesmen. Over 4,000 churches closed in America, closed in America in 2019. Over 1,700 1, pastors left the ministry every month 
over the past year. The average stay at a church for a pastor is about four years. A youth pastor is about three. The revolving door of faith leaders makes churches doubt pastors and even community doubts pastors. Clergy is a stressful position. Uh, pastors are often very busy, resulting in physical and emotional exhaustion. In fact, a study conducted by the Clergy Health Initiative at Duke Divinity School shows that the demands placed on clergy by themselves and others puts pastors at far greater risk for depression than individuals with other occupations. The study published by the yeah. Journal of Primary Prevention compared the mental health of 95% of the United Methodist clergy in North America, 1,726 pastors, to a representative sample of Americans and identify key factors that predicted depression and anxiety. We may be seen as at times lacking compassion or being indifferent to serving people because of tiredness. Some churches even expect their pastors to be competent in areas that are outside and beyond their scope. Yet in the midst of COVID-19 and its crisis, we were called to carry the weight and sorrow and fears of our own families while having to craft programs and respond to cater to the cares of a fearful and chaotic community. The heroic acts of faith leaders across the nation revealed the creative genius that rests with inside the community of these leaders. With having to find creative ways to minister hope, distribute food and educate our community, we instantly became multilingual and learned to speak the language of COVID fluently. Absent of medical degrees, we instantly learned the lexicon of doctors and politicians. We learned to speak yeah. pandemic and protest at the same time. In this era, I've known pastors who have died from COVID-19, quit because of COVID-19, or who have sadly taken their lives due to this pandemic. Few of them were recognized for their service, noticed or heralded, heralded for their contributions through this crisis. Faith leaders have an open door and open arm policy in an era where other professions with proper support are hesitant to do so. Faith leaders serve faithfully and unwaver unwavering, and even with a commitment that too cost us our lives. Our impact is undermentioned, undervalued, and many times unnoticed. We exist to take a stab at removing the inequities that reign in our community, but unfortunately, COVID exposed the chasm that still remains in underserved areas which often house under-resourced faith communities. I wanted to do a fancy slide presentation while still selecting to use my time to be the voice of the underserved and underappreciated in our community. Therefore, a PowerPoint presentation will be sent to the facilitator of this meeting for you all to reference at a later time. But I really wanted to reach to our hearts and ask how many of us have encouraged a pastor? How many of us have done a mental check on our rabbi or sent support to our imam? Many will, were severely challenged with severely challenged budgets who were already strapped, called to pay bills to keep families afloat until unemployment kicked in. They were called to care for a community that they couldn't touch, and they were expected to provide support in areas with their, where they needed to be supported themselves. I would love to laud the number of things that the River Church and many of my colleagues have accomplished through this pandemic. But the truth is we're only a small composite and a microcosm on the spectrum of church and the faith community at large. While sustaining a staff of, of 23 employees, we fed thousands and we sent over the last four months $100,000 to failing churches and struggling members in our community. Over the last four months, we've served and ministered to 45 grieving families. Over the last four months, we've marched, we've protested, we've spoken at rallies, created education boards to support our educators and our students. We bought laptops, we provided mental health support. We've helped people navigate an unemployment system that very few were clueless about. 
We've extended our worship facility to members of our community to have free funerals. We've inundated our community with COVID facts and health tips. Our efforts and our impact are qualified and quantified in time, effort, money, tears, frustration, and pain. Where's the data? It can't be calculated. The man hours are incalculable. The money that goes from a faith leader's hands to a failing family cannot be measured. We were deemed to be the key to solve and in some sense become the solution in the COVID crisis, yet our allocated resources didn't reflect the trust and the hope that our communities put into us. Salvation is free, but ministry costs. Our impact has been great, but greatly to the detriment of many of our budgets. As we continue to play our role as the nucleus in our community, my prayer is that someone would commit to advocating for the faith leader in your community as they are called to eradicate the disparities and look to solve the ills of society as we continue to make our community healthier, smarter, more prosperous, more politically responsible and astute. I pray that someone listening to me today's conscience is raised and that at least one of you commits yourself to the plight of every faith leader in your community. I thank you for the time to share with you and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Bishop Gabi. That was amazing how much detail you shared about um, being an essential worker and the critical examples that you gave and the sacrifice that you and your staff are doing and the impact, which you have measurable impact, which is something that's really important that people don't realize that many of our pastors have data and collect information to demonstrate your impact. Thank you so much. Now we'll hear from Dr. McNair. Dr. McNair. Yes, God bless you. All right. God bless you. And again, thank you again for allowing me to be a part of this presentation. And uh, I trust that you all can see my screen. Yes, we can. We can. Okay. Uh, I want to say again to uh, Ms. Colleen, thank you so much for having us. And uh, um, Dr. Uh, Bishop Godby, thank you so much for your words of expression. You certainly have spoken in the heart of many pastors. My assignment is to talk about faith leadership supporting families. And I just added beyond the pulpit. Because uh, certainly what we do has to stretch beyond the pulpit. And I'm going to share with you things that we have done and we share with other of our pastors that are doing it and things that we can also implement. And the first thing I put was provided, provide leveled teaching on COVID-19. Um, it, it is a necessity that we provide teaching on COVID-19 on every level. When we pass to people, we pass to people of all walks of life. And some of them can hear what's being said on television, but not understand it and full detail. So what the church does is provide level teaching on COVID-19 for every level of understanding. Um, I also put up here a recommended site uh, to help pastors, faith leaders do this teaching COVID-19 presentation for educators. Uh, they provide Google slides for this and I put the um, information up there where you can access that. Also, to help our community, we inform them on COVID-19 testing location, provide scheduled transportation to get them to and fro those locations to be testing. Provide teaching for community youth on COVID-19. And when you start teaching the youth on a whole nother level, I do recommend going to a site that is called everydayhealth.com. And you can just key in how to teach COVID-19 safety to your kids. Um, I found this to be a very useful resource that my youth leaders are using to educate the young people um, on COVID-19. Okay, now the next slide here deals with counseling. We provide counseling for families with infected family members um, and also provide counseling for families struggling with the fear of death and coping with global death numbers. And what I'm experiencing is we actually have some members in the community who literally have been inside since March um, who are just afraid 
of um, the death numbers, the tolls that they're seeing on television. And so we actually had some one-on-one -on -one Zoom lessons with them to break that fear of death off of them and help them to cope with what there's the global number that they're seeing. And we found that to be effective. And I, I passed it on because a lot of times we overlook that they're the group of people who are just struggling with the fear of death and being able to cope with the global number that they're seeing on the television. Um, we have some family members who was affected uh, by COVID-19 and the members of the family needed counseling as well as the person who's going through the infection but the family members who needed their help also. The next thing is provide community food drive monthly and bi-weekly. Um, as we are trying to keep the church's hand on the community and to meet their needs, not only mentally, but also their physical needs. One of the things that we're doing is providing the food drive monthly. Um, I recommend this uh, bi-weekly. We were doing it bi-weekly, we're now doing it monthly. And as the need uh, picks up, we go back to about weekly. Um, the other thing is provide back to school supplies, giveaways for each semester. Normally we do this um, just once a year uh, with homeschooling and with so many parents now in our community that have had job losses. We realize that the need to help their children with school supplies is greater that we have to do it more than once a year. So we are prepared and I encourage other pastors to be prepared to help them with school supplies throughout the year. The next thing is to turn your church into a community hotline, a resource pool for COVID questions. And in our community, we try to make this a one-stop shop for everything that they're going to need um, through the church. The next thing is churches can provide outside movie night for adults and youth to give families uh, out of the house activities to do. We know that Dave and Buster's are closed down. We know that the movie theaters are closed down and everywhere that you would take your children to to have a family night out most of those places are closed. So on one side of the church, we have the adults uh, watching a movie. On the other side, we have the youth uh, practicing social distancing. Most of them, it's like a drive-in theater. Uh, with the children, we're doing social distancing, which is also another time for us to teach them the importance of social distancing. We provide face masks for those children that are sitting outside, and face masks for the adults that come on the property. And this will also help parents get a little break and possibly help prevent parental burnout and child abuse. Uh, these children are with their parents 24 seven. Uh, the outlet that the parents usually get by sending the children to school every day, giving them that eight, nine hour break, they're not getting that. And just being realistic that parents are, are having a little burnout with their children. And so the church is another avenue where we can be all as a, I like what Dr. Godby said, sometimes we become all things to all people. And so this is another avenue that we can help our families by giving that time away. And again, this can be done weekly or monthly. Uh, the weather changing may force you inside if you're able to do social distancing, but it is a positive thing that we found to be very effective in our community and um, very appreciated. The next thing, is remember that all families do not have wireless services in their homes. Therefore, it becomes a problem with homeschooling and the students being able to efficiently do their homework and assignments. What we're discovering is that Bojangles, the Wash Houses, Taco Bell, these places with internet, we're actually seeing students in there, children in there, um, because they don't have internet service at home. And so one family um, goes to the Taco Bell and parks out there for the entire school day of the child to be, have access to uh, the internet. And I think sometimes we forget that we pass the people again on all levels in our community. And some of the amenities that we take advantage of or that we just take for granted that they don't have these things such as internet service. Therefore, uh, what we have done and what I recommend the church uh, could boost their internet wireless service and provide access for students that want to come to the church to log on for school purposes. Now, we boosted out so strong that they can actually come to the parking lot, um, table set up, social distancing, and they can actually have um, a time that they can log on there, uh, weather permits, outside social distancing, as long as the weather permits, and then inside with social distancing in the sanctuary where they can spread out and have internet access to do their schoolwork and um, certain times in the afternoon 
to do their homework. Um, we also provide volunteer workers for tutoring and supervising. I think it just amazed me. Uh, for one thing, my church sits in the midst of a housing project. And so it just amazed me about how many um, persons actually don't have internet access. And so this was a great tool. Bishop McNair, you just muted, sir. You're muted, sir. Okay, am I back? Yes, sir. All right, thank yes, you. Yes, you're back. So we missed maybe your last sentence. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Gailier. All right. All right. So assisting with their educational needs. Um, you can research companies and computer makers about uh, donating laptops to help the disadvantaged children. I contacted some and I had some donated, um, I contacted Google and they have donated Google Chromebooks for the disadvantaged children in my area. In fact, I'm actually looking for my second batch of Chromebooks to come in now uh, to sign out to more disadvantaged children. I found this has been a great tool because a lot of children, uh, homes, you know, their parents have smartphones. It's amazing that the parents can have, you know, a thousand dollar smartphone but not have a $200 notebook for their children to do schoolwork on, but this is the society that we're living in and serving. Uh, and so this has been a great help to the children in this community uh, that they can come here and Pastor McNair, the church has provided for them Chromebooks to do their homework on, and some of them can sign them out to take them home. And um, as, as I said, we could, you could research companies, computer makers that will uh, donate the books. I do know that uh, I've been successful with Google and Google Chrome uh, have, Google have given me so many Chromebooks for our disadvantaged children. And um, I wanted to go quickly, but that's all I have right there that we've been doing for the community and things that we can recommend that other um, can do also. That's, that's my last one. That's great. This was wonderful, um, um, Dr. McNair. Uh, I'm going to go, well, uh, there's a question that came out. We'll, we'll get to the Q&A. It was a really good question. Um, we're going to now go to Pastor Gallier. That was wonderful. I, I, before, I, before you speak, Pastor Gallier, one of the things that was really important that you built off of um, Bishop Godby's point about being the one-stop shop and that if you weren't there to provide that service, the question is, who would? And it sounds like there may not have been anybody who was going to provide that if you had not stepped up to the plate, Dr. McNair, to provide these services for the community. Therefore, for families to be able to have this space. So I just appreciate what you've shared. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, absolutely. Pastor Gailyard. I am here. Good afternoon, everyone, and um, really appreciate the opportunity to share alongside of uh, Pastors Godby and McNair and uh, to Dr. Lori Carter Edwards and Dr. Goldie uh, smith Bird. Thank you so much for the, um, the invitation. I've been tasked with talking a little bit about improving and maintaining the health and wellness of faith leaders. And so I'm going to go through a really short slide deck. And, and I just want to say this um, in, in the onset is that what I'm going to talk about it's not limited to pastors, but faith leaders in their totality, um, elders, deacons, a um, whole range of church leaders, but also community-based leaders and just leaders in general. And so just keep that in mind as we walk through it. I think the thing to be mindful of is, and Dr. Uh, Lori Carter Edwards uh, mentioned this in the introduction, that, that COVID has really stripped the veneer um, from some things. And we talk about um, how prevalent health disparities are in our community. But what we have not talked about is that COVID has overall exposed the spirituality, the systems, and the structures that have been lacking, um, particularly in our churches. And so one of the things that makes this challenging for faith leaders is that in order to sustain yourself beyond COVID, if there were any, anything in the spirituality of the church, in the systems, of, or the structures of the church that have been lacking, now we're at a point where those things have been exposed and have to get dealt with. And so this can be a very stressful, very difficult time for faith leaders. I think one of the mistakes that we make, however, is that we keep looking for the end 
as if we don't have to address things. And I think it's important to understand that we are in a season of improving and not removing. And so we ought to be really looking at how we become better as a result of this pandemic. And so I wanna cover very quickly seven or eight uh, items. Number one, in terms of health and wellness, is just taking the personal evaluation. Understanding that one size does not fit all. What works for a mega church may not work for a community, may not work for a storefront church. And so really helping pastors and faith leaders and leaders in general understand this is the time you take a step back, evaluate yourself, and also understanding that, understand to know where you're lacking, to be very, very honest. And I think the other part of this personal evaluation is networking with other pastors and leaders. And what I mean by that is not just networking with other pastors and leaders where you are the leader, but networking with other pastors and leaders so that you can then learn, grow, be developed by them and what other churches are doing and what other community-based organizations are doing. The next piece after personal evaluation is pastoral emphasis. I think this is a time where pastors have to really re-emphasize the work that really matters. We've got to decide what we say yes to and what we say no to. Number one, to maintain your health and wellness, you need to keep pastoring. It's going to look different, but you need to continue pastoring. We have to have a focus on caring for a broader base of people. So I talk about caring for the 80% and not just the 20%. We need to calculate what the future is going to look like. This, is, this needs to be a part of our pastoral emphasis. Things are going to look different for churches. And we have to be very, very cautious that we're not investing in areas that are no longer going to be as significant and as uh, important to our overall mission and function. I think this is also a time, and uh, Pastor McNair and um, Bishop Godby both touched on this, um, the importance of com our community missions and our collaborative relationships. This is an important time where we have to emphasize this as pastors and as leaders. Um, a concentration on sustainable solutions and not reopening. This is gonna be a part of your health and wellness. If you are constantly just waiting on the reopening, we're gonna reopen, it's gonna look like this when we reopen. I think that is the wrong emphasis. We need to be talking about sustainable solutions for the future. What if you don't open for another 12 months? Uh, in our church, We've been out of uh, in-person worship for six months, like most churches. And I've already, I, I announced several months ago that we would not return in 2020. And most recently I said to my congregation, it, it may be another 12 months before we're back to in-person worshiping. So we need to concentrate on sustainable solutions. Um, and then communicating by every possible means, um, proactively and not reactively. And if I have opportunity, I'll talk a little bit more about that. These are just general things we should be doing to maintain our health and wellness anyway. The truth of the matter, those of us who are leaders are sometimes not very good at it. Some of um, the least healthy people that we see are people in our own congregations, which is why we have so many health disparities, particularly in rural communities. And oftentimes it's because as leaders, we're not modeling the right behavior around health and wellness. And so the next part, the next recommendation is just properly, properly eating. I think one of the greatest gifts we've been given is from a health perspective to say, hey, I need to, I need to be home more and we need to cook at home and we need to look at what those healthy eating and healthy food preparation options are. And so I think changing how we eat is a major aspect of our overall health and wellness. Many of us are really gifted, really anointed, but if you're, your blood pressure is high or your knees are bad or you just simply can't move, how much you love your spouse, how anointed you are, how much you love your kids, all that stuff is out of the window. So we need to take good care of our bodies. Um, and another part of that, the fourth element is planned exercise. I mean, this is the opportunity now where we can walk, we can, you know, many churches, ours are doing it, many other churches are doing it, but we've created mile markers, quarter mile markers around our building. People can come in and they can walk around the building, they can stop and there's a, there's a post there, this is a quarter mile, you can pray, you can walk, whatever the case is, exercise. So I think there needs to be planned exercise. And this is an important part because when we talk about health and wellness, we generally don't talk about our emotional health um, and our mental health. And it's very, very important aspects. And so I encourage pastors and leaders to protect their emotions. And in order to do that, I think this is an opportune time to create a new list. And so making a list of what our priorities look like sharing that list if you're married with your spouse and giving your spouse the opportunity to pencil some stuff off 
reprioritizing the list based upon what is going on right now, having an ability to practice saying no. We have to understand what we're supposed to say yes to and how do we say no to the things that we should not be doing. Um, and then we need to be intentional about what goes into our minds in terms of balancing um, our media and our reading. I think that's a really important aspect because and, and we just the debate last night, social media, it can really, really bog you down mentally and emotionally. And we have to be able to protect that. Programmed ease, this is about unplugging. This is about having a bedtime. This may sound like basic stuff, but if you listen to what Bishop God be communicating, if you listen to what Apostle McNair is communicating about how, how open the church is, how active we are, how involved we are, if we don't schedule time to unplug, if we don't have a sabbatical schedule, in many pastors, it, looks, it needs to look like a day a week, a week a month, a month a year. But we need to have some kind of sabbatical schedule, some type of planning where we're unplugging. So programmed ease, playful enjoyment, identifying what gives you joy and going to do it, right? God is not interested in discon discontented Christians. I'm a motorcyclist. And so I love jumping on my Harley. Like that's my playful enjoyment, right? And I get on my bike and I can kind of, you know, get on the road and just kind of unwind and, un and relax. But we need to figure out what we can do playfully to enjoy ourselves. And this is going to be a little bit controversial, but this is my last slide. Prudent economics. Uh, one of the things that I think we, we're seeing now uh, with COVID is the importance of having been good stewards. The churches that are faring best right now are the churches that had six months, nine months, a year reserves, that had good financial infrastructure. This is a time during COVID. This is much of what people are stressed about is financial. And so if we are living beneath our means, um, if we're able to, if we're able to live beneath our means, we're understanding the importance of stewardship at this hour, I think in the overall perspective, it's going to help um, our health and our wellness. And I can say a whole lot more about how we do that and what we do. And so that's my last slide. I'm happy to take any questions along with Pastor McNair and Pastor Gobby. All my contact information is there. I tweet at J.D. Galliard. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pastor Galliard, for giving those prescriptive um, recommendations for not only if there are other faith leaders on, but others who may be working with um, you and other faith leaders and the importance of this collaboration being the greater, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. So wonderful presentations by all of you. Thank you so much, um, Bishop Godby, Dr. McNair and Pastor Galliard. Right now, what we're going to do before we go into some Q and A's is we're going to um, ask that Dr. Bird give a summary of what she heard from all three of you so that we can all be centered in this space of some of the recommendations and highlights from what you all have shared in this brief moment. Um, Dr. Bird? Yes, Lori, can you hear me? And let me yes, we can hear you, thank you. Yes. Um, okay, so the, the host has stopped me from showing myself, so I can do this without that. Um, so the, the last thing I ever want to do is to summarize what pastors and faith leaders say. But since Lori asked me to do this, I'll, I'll give it a shot. So um, first of all, again, let me thank all of you, uh, as Lori's already done, um, for this very powerful session today. It, it, it helps all of us. And whether we are faith leaders or not, I think we all have, have really learned and grown, grown from what you have said. So uh, Bishop Godby, very, very um, um, excited about your just articulating some of the things that our faith leaders have already shared with us in terms of some of the stress that you and, and your colleagues go through. Um, certainly leadership in this space is, is very, very challenging. And so we, we owe it to our faith community as academicians, as as folks with in, in all different kinds of and walks of life to assure that we are reaching out in our own spaces to say that we are very grateful and also how can we help? And so as a, an academician myself, there's something that, that our network has, uh, has been talking about and certainly 
have been trying to reach out. And I think all of us should. So we really appreciate that, that, that concept of helping us to understand that everything, just Sunday mornings are, are not like Sunday mornings have been. And we have so many different kinds of stresses on our plates. And you as faith leaders in our communities trying to make ends meet and make all kinds of connections, certainly it's a major stress and something that we have to, to um, begin to support. Um, your mental health and your, your spiritual health are all very important. And we tend to, to pour, uh, we, we tend to grab from you without giving back into you as faith leaders. And so thank you so much for helping us to realize some of the big stresses that you are going through and, and, and the responsibility for all of us to make sure that we are helping tangibly in ways that, that you can feel our support as a community pouring back into you. And then um, um, Apostle McNair, uh, I, I think we should just write a book on some of the things that you, you shared with us, uh, some of the ways that you've had. And, and we know that because we talk to you often and we know that some of the things that you're doing and, and being in the community, right in the heart of the community and many of our, our um, churches are in the heart of, right in the heart of communities that have the most need. And you always help us to find a resource somehow. You always leave us with a resource or two that we can take away. As an example, Google and the Chromebooks um, and, and, and helping families. Um, you talked about being uh, present at different levels within families and different levels of community those that have different levels of income, different levels of education, and being present at, at, at multiple levels and not leaving anybody out, being inclusive and very thoughtful about the kinds of things that people need, things that people are telling you they need. So very, very powerful. Um, and then of course, Pastor, Pastor Garriott, um, uh, just always leaving us again with many nuggets that we can take a, away. Uh, again, no, no one size fits all, but just some very tangible things that we all need to be doing. Uh, you gave us about eight things that we need to think of, be thinking about uh, as uh, people of faith. Again, knowing where we are, um, knowing how to link with others who are going through what we're going through uh, as far as pastors and faith leaders linking to each other, no, understanding that together we are better, we do it better when we are connected. Um, taking care of, of, of the future, understanding what this is going to mean. We don't really know when we're going to get back into the church as we knew it. But taking care of the pastor, as, as uh, Pastor God be mentioned as well. And then you talked about exercising and not going out to eat quite as much. And as much as we miss that, I, I agree with you. I think it is good. Now we can mess up if we cook too, depending upon how we cook. But, uh, but I think that just being with the family and as much as um, it can cause issues being so tightly knitted together sometimes, it is so good to be with family uh, and to reconnect in ways that perhaps we would not have. And then um, I, I really I was struck by your comment about um, being mindful of what goes into the mind, um, being able to disconnect. Uh, we can make CNN and MSNBC or Fox, if that's what you watch, uh, that can become a habit and it can become a negative habit. Um, you talked about playing. I golf and, and, and I do that once a week and it's gotta be a real emergency for me to miss that golf date once a week. And that's what I do with my family and friends and it takes me away from my work and the stress of, the, of life around us and just being playful a little bit. I think we've kind of forgotten how to do some of that. And so this is perhaps one of the things. And then of course the economics part that you said is probably a little controversial, but that is helpful for all of us, uh, whether it's our families, whether we are um, spending beyond our means or we just don't have the means from the beginning is something that we collectively with the faith community should be thinking about. Um, very tangible things that we can do to help our communities narrow this wealth gap. And so that it's very complex, but even though you said it was gonna be controversial, we're very happy that you brought that up. Very important points. And so I'm sure I missed some things, Lori, 
Um, but again, I'm always stressed when I have to go behind a, a pastor or faith leader. So I, <laughs> I so appreciate all of your comments. This is very helpful to all of us, whether we are faith leaders or not. Thank you all so much. I agree. And I, I thank you so much for summarizing. And definitely we don't speak for our, our pastors that we, that we partner with very closely and trust and try to serve as much as we can. Your vision is from your perspective as one who is committed to the cause. And it was just great to hear you summarize this. I'm going to open up now some questions and I'm going to start with one question because I know of, I, I think this is an interesting question that I think that all three pastors will be able to answer. And uh, let me mention this. So here's the question. There is no doubt that faith leaders and churches have historically stepped in when government services have lacked. Why aren't there more Reverend Barbers or Dr. Kings to leave the pulpit and speak to those who create the disparities? What is the responsibility, if any, for the church leader to address and speak to the longstanding poor outcomes designed by institutions? Any one of you feel free to answer. Well, I'll, I'll start. I, I think that I, I think that there are lots of Dr. Kings and Dr. Barbers. Uh, that's first of all, um, and understanding that the way disparities are addressed, the way inequity is addressed, is you need to have operatives at every level. So you need to have people protesting and boycotting, and you also have need to have people that are organizing um, and that are administrating. And I think you, you've got three examples of churches that are actively engaged in addressing issues of disparity and inequity. And one of the most powerful tools we have is still our pulpit, right? So when we speak to that captive audience on a Sunday morning, we're able to motivate people, speak to issues of injustice and inequity, motivate people to then run for office, make sure they're taking their census, make sure they're voting. And so and as much as you always need as many people in this space as possible, I think that we have a lot of pastors and churches that are occupying this space. Amen. I agree with Dr. Uh, Gillian. I, I agree with him 100%. And there are many Dr. Barbers and Dr. Kings. However, everyone does not need to become a Dr. Barber and a Dr. King. Also, earlier, Dr. Gillian stated that sometimes pastors just need to jump on board so what someone else is leading and being part of that and push that. Uh, what Dr. Barber's doing, I'm not, I'm not trying to be a Dr. Barber, but I have jumped on board with Dr. Barber, uh, pushing that and also using my voice, echoing Dr. Barber through the pulpit, social media and live stream. I think it's important, again, that everyone not try to become a Dr. Barber or a Dr. King, but latch on to those that are already leading the way and making headway. I truly echo the sentiment. Thank you for that, Dr. McNair. Bishop Garber? Yeah, go yeah. ahead. I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Bishop, go ahead. I truly echo the sentiments of my brothers. They've wonderfully articulated uh, what needs to be stated. But here's something that I want to raise our conscience about as well. Uh, for the River Church, through the pandemic, it was extremely important for us to do more of what we do and not to become something that we haven't been. Uh, a lot of times we try to pull pastors into places that we try to craft the narrative for them and say, this is what they should do. But there are some things that certain leaders don't do well, and we need to leave them in their space and let them function in a capacity where they're helpful and where they're most needed. And we can allow our Dr. Barbers to be Dr. Barbers, and they can speak to those areas because they are called to do so. And so, like my brother has wonderfully articulated, you know, we need to support and get behind, but we also need to be clear about what we're called to do as well. And we're not called to do all things. Thank you. Thank you so much for that feedback. A question that's to Dr. McNair, but all of you can answer if you have the capacity to do so. Dr. McNair, what type of screening procedures do you have in place before allowing people to come on site? Okay, we have um, temperature checks, we have um, sanitizing procedures in place, and we also have a uh, waiver that they have to sign. 
And that's not just for the adults, that's for the, the, the children. Parents have to sign a waiver for them. And then our social distancing, actually uh, any outdoor event, we actually do more than six feet apart. And we provide face mask coverings for them who arrive with, who, don't, who do not have it. Great, thank you so much, Dr. McNair. Pastor Galliard or Bishop Gopi, do you have any other um, screening procedures that you wanna bring up? Yes, ma'am, we have a wonderful system where you have to check in via your app. Uh, that notifies you when you can enter the building. Upon entering the building, we have a kiosk that you have to pass through that's manned by uh, healthcare workers. And as you pass by the kiosk, it takes your temperature. You're required to then put hand sanitizer on and to wear a mask before you can enter our, our facility. All social distance requirements are uh, acknowledged and they are maintained. Traffic patterns have been created you can only follow those traffic patterns while you're in our building because we must con continue to give attention to not cross contaminating or coming across each other. So we have to maintain those protocols. We have certain capacities that have been established for each one of our areas where we worship as well as for our restaurant facilities as well. Those things are monitored and we maintain the list as to everyone who comes into our facility. So God forbid, were there contact, we would be able to immediately reach to those who have been in contact with that individual. Thank you, Bishop. Pastor Gilliard? I, I think they've covered it all, yeah. <laughs> okay, great. So I'll go ahead and ask the next question. Um, how has your perception of the role of church in the community changed over the course of the COVID pandemic? Um, if, if I could jump in here on this, I think COVID-19 has been a help to the church actually, because it has helped us to change our image in the eyes of our community. And being outside of the church for, I can take my uh, area for uh, example. Uh, we're outside. We did the social media online, live stream services. Then I decided to have on-site drive-in services. This has helped our church um, to put the gospel out there, outdoors. And I have seen the community come out. Again, I passed in the community where there's housing developments all around me. And people who have been coming to the church for special occasions, but not on Sunday morning, now bringing their chairs outside, they sit outside on their porches like clockwork every Sunday to hear the word of God. Um, this has allowed us to change the image of the church in the eyes of the community who may have had a, a, a bad view of what the church is all about, all about uh, getting, 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 and never giving the amenities and the services that we're providing is causing them to see the church in another light and the church should be seen. In fact, at my second location, um, to get it, one of the ladies who came through the drive for the uh, food drive, she said, why, why, why are y'all doing this now? She said, we, we never known y'all to uh, reach out like this. And I said, well, we've always been reaching. It's just that you haven't had the need. And so, she said, well, I think this is a wonderful thing that you're doing. So with that person, the image of the church has been changed in her mind. I think this has been a positive thing that comes out of COVID-19 for the churches. If I, if I think I answered your question. Yes, that was a great response. Um, Pastor Galliard or Bishop, would you like to um, chime in? Yeah, I would just quickly say that, you know, for us, in terms of our community engagement, um, it's always been there. And so I, I think what COVID has done to um, Pastor McNair's point is that the church has always been, and particularly the black church, has always been the trusted voice in the community. Mm -hmm. um, we share, we, our, the community trusts us and, and, and the community shares our values. And so because of that, we have been able to leverage that value system and that trust and the community is open to what we're offering. And so we've always been actively engaged in the community. And I think now this is just making it more 
obvious of how significant the church is. I will say this for those who don't know, but with the exception of Florida and Texas, there are more churches in North Carolina than any other state in the country. And so this is a right. valid resource in all 100 counties that all organizations need to really take advantage of because we're here to serve people. Excellent. Thank you so much for that. Bishop, would you like to chime in? Sure. And, you know, again, uh, as Reverend Gilliard said, you know, it's just been more of the same for many of us, just on steroids. But we're continuing to do what we've always done. Um, the thing that I think that has been the greatest outcome for the church is it has stretched many leaders. Uh, it's called us to break and have a paradigm shift. And it's caused people who have been stuck in their traditional traps to have to think in a creative way about what ministry looks like. And so one of the greatest outcomes of this is it has pushed leaders into a space of visioning again, thinking about what the church looks like beyond this moment. And so it's really stirred a passion in most leaders. And it's exciting for me to see that the church has been ignited to dream again and to do again and to believe beyond a moment that others thought would paralyze us and hinder us in a great way. So I see churches that would not normally go near streaming, having to stream, having to exist in, you know, uh, multiple dimensions and, you know, be multifaceted in their approach to ministry. And to me, that's been one of the greatest outcomes of this moment. So I'm excited to see what the emerging church will look like once all are back present and accounted for and how we will continue to move the church forward. Given that point and um, given the point that both um, Dr. McNair and Pastor Gilliard mentioned around trust, uh, we'll try to see if we can get two more questions, but I wanna ask this particular one in that context. Given that you are the trusted voices in your community, how might there be better connections and partnerships between churches and federal agencies looking to collaborate to address health disparities? Well, I'll, I'll start because I mean, we're doing some of this work. I mean, we're working with, you know, as you know, UNC Gilling School of Public Health. Um, we're doing rapid rehousing with, um, uh, with the uh, Department of Justice and also with the Department of Health and Human Services. And so we're doing some federal stuff and some state work. I would, my, my very first recommendation is invite the faith community to the table. I mean, I think oftentimes what happens is that we don't get invited to the table. We have infrastructure. We have ability. Uh, we have um, strong administration. I mean, you've heard the, the, just the examples given by Pastors McNair and Godby around what their process is to make sure that people are safe when they're in our buildings. And so our, our systems are robust. You know, many of us are in very strong positions financially. We have infrastructure. I mean, think about it. You know, we have Wi-Fi, we have classrooms, we have parking lots, we have, we have infrastructure. And so we have administration, we have human capital. And so I, I really think the, the way we do this is that we need, to, we need to encourage federal and state and private entities and even foundations because foundations are not friendly to the faith community. We would be very honest for the most part. They all need to understand the value of the faith community and invite us to the table. And don't invite us to the table when the table is already set. Invite us to the table so we can help develop the agenda because we really do understand the community issues and we're closest to the people. Thank you for that response, Pastor Gilliard. We have about one minute left, um, Dr. McNair and um, Bishop Gobby, if you wanna tackle that. Um, actually, we have about 30 seconds. So if, if one I, of you wanna tackle I, I it before- Dr. Um, did a wonderful job on that. And uh, there's not much more to be added to that. You know, the church is the resource pool, but we deserve a seat at the table and we have to demand that place uh, from the mayors on up mm -hmm. to the state level, to the federal level. Bishop? Yeah, and I'll close with this. We're not your grandma's church. You know, the church has evolved and advanced in ways that, you know, again, we run, you know, multi million dollar corporations. And so we do, like Reverend Gilliard said, we have infrastructure that is unknown until they explore just how competent and capable we are as organizations. 
And so we would ask that people would come in and see what we do and understand that, you know, we're not the mom and pop church on the corner. That's right. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate it. Colleen? Yes, thank you, Lori. I want to take this time and thank all of our presenters, Pastors Godby, McNair, Galleon, and of course, our co-moderators, Dr. Lori Carter-Edwards and Dr. Goldie Smith-Bird. Thank you so much for presenting today. Thank you for giving us, you know, much to think about in terms of how faith leaders support our communities and, and also how we in the community can better support you all. Um, I apologize to those who tried to get on using Facebook Live. Apparently that did not work, but this session has been recorded and will be posted on the Triple E website and also emailed to all the attendees today. So again, thank you all for attending. Thanks to our presenters. Have a great and rest Colleen, of your day. Colleen, the questions. We'll have the questions for people. We'll, we'll, we'll ask the pastors if they're able to the questions. That, yes, that thank you, Lori. Answered. We will also get the question, the answers to the questions that we weren't able to tackle during this hour and share with our attendees. Thanks, right. everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, <laughs> Bishop, Dr. Pastor, and Goldie. Bye-bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye.